Hello, everyone. Um, it's great that you could join. Uh, for those who I have the pleasure of meeting, my name is Mike Moe, founder of, of GSV. Welcome to the third part of our virtual uh, summit series for GSV. Uh, the fan, we've had fantastic feedback, so we greatly appreciate you tuning in. Uh, GSV's mission has um, remained to give everybody an equal opportunity to participate in the future, and we think these summit series is something that is uh, very important, particularly at a time like now, to give everybody hope and everybody opportunity. Two months ago, the unemployment was at record lows. The stock market was at record highs. The world was awash in cash. Obviously, things have changed over the last couple of months. Just a month ago, we were on planes all over the world raising money for GSV Ventures' second education and learning fund. And uh, now we're spending uh, all day and night on Zoom calls in places all over the world. So geography is, uh, doesn't make as much uh, difference in a virtual world and time zones certainly don't. So when we talk about the Summit Series starting at four Greenwich Mean Time, and I think that might be increasingly the way things are as, 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 as we go ahead. This morning, um, I'm very, very excited to have a conversation with my longtime friend, Rob Pace, um, clearly, there's been nobody who's been more impacted uh, with the coronavirus than not-for-profits. And Rob, with 100X, has a, a very ingenious way to raise money efficiently and pain-free for not-for-profits and have a lot of other positive benefit for corporations and other constituents. Rob uh, has a, a remarkable career. Rob was uh, the uh, head of capital markets and a longtime partner at Goldman Sachs. I mentioned that because what that suggests is you don't get that position unless you're very sophisticated financially. Rob was also the chairman of the Salvation Army, which is the second largest not-for-profit in the world. I mentioned that because Rob has a very uh, good understanding of how not-for-profits work and some of the challenges that they have. And, uh, and what 100X is doing, I think, is, is pretty special. And so with that, Rob, welcome. It's great to have you on our virtual summit series. Hi, Mike, and uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. So, Rob, tell us about 100X and what Data for Good is all about. And so, our passion, as you alluded to, Mike, is to try to create a new type of business that solves business problems, but just organically does good in the process. So. Data for good is kind of what it sounds like. It's how do we create high quality data in a way that does good. And the good in this case is it provides funding for nonprofits. So the, the goal is to have a business model who organically creates large amounts of dollars for nonprofits by solving urgent business needs. So give us some examples of this. So who are some of the not-for-profits you've worked with and how does it work? So how, how do you actually from, you know, get the, the help to not-for-profits and what kind of insights are you able to provide and how? Yeah, so let, let me flip that if I can. So the business problem that we're solving is actually the number one data need of CEOs, which is the ability to listen. In other words, to really understand the customer's needs and preferences. And over $50 billion a year is spent annually on that, and yet only 15% of CEOs say they feel like they really understand their customer. So our solution to that is nonprofits have an amazing asset, which is they have the crowd. They have the passion of the audiences. So what we do is we basically provide a very easy turnkey way for nonprofits to go out to their audience and say, hey, will you help us raise money? All you do is opt in in a very secure platform and over a 30 day campaign, just give your opinion on businesses. In fact, there's 1,500 businesses and brands, and the consumer picks them. And every time they provide that feedback, they're clipping away 
$2. It takes them about a minute. And so the average person, if they have 50, uh, 50 uh, opinions, creates $100. And if you have 1,000 people, that's $100,000. So just finally to answer your question, we work with a diverse group of nonprofits from the National Urban League to K through 12 public schools, churches, youth sports leagues, et cetera, to help them create a new asset, which is the passion of their crowd. So how does this work? I go to Chipotle, or I used to go to Chipotle, or I, uh, I did a, a purchase on uh, Nike.com. Uh, what does that work? So I, I go to my phone. Tell me, how does this actually work for the, for the person that wants to do the, the, the input? Yeah, so all the person needs is access to a, to a device and their insights. So the person actually, unlike a traditional survey, the person actually picks the brands. So if you think about it, you probably know, in addition to Chipotle, a half a dozen restaurants very well, your phone, Facebook, Netflix, Peloton, Dollar General, whatever the constellation of brands that, that you know. And so you're driving, you're picking the companies during this period, and you're just basically in an emoji-based process saying, here's what this business needs to know. And so this gets back to my point of businesses then hear from a very diverse crowd, the truth in a way that they can benchmark, et cetera. So it ends up that the nonprofits are the key to unlocking a superior product, which in turn allows us to get a lot of money to nonprofits. So basically what you're doing is you're giving a company uh, effectively real time and, you know, you know, MPS, and other insights, but it's like real-time insight to what's actually going on with their business, real-time. And you're giving the voice to the different participants um, to let them share kind of what they're really thinking and the money that they're generating for that minute or less input goes to something they're passionate about, a not-for-profit they're passionate about. Yeah, so from a consumer standpoint, everybody can participate, no matter who they are or the amount of money they have. We value everybody's opinions the same. And businesses, while it's de-identified, can hear from kind of more typical consumers, not only what they think about their company, but competitive companies, all the other brands that they shop at, et cetera. So it's a, it's a very different data set. And really the nonprofits though, and the passion that they create are the key to unlocking that whole ecosystem. So, so Rob, you know, you were a partner at Goldman Sachs for a number of years. You obviously understand financial markets this data seems like it could have a lot of implication for uh, other people besides just the companies and give them better insights to what's going on with their, with their business. It would seem to give pretty unique, valuable insights for investors as well. Yeah, and I think in a post-COVID world too, I mean, the real question we is what- that, We call that AD, after disease. We got in, a, in, in, an AD, AD. in an AD world, um, the need to listen has never been greater. You know, what's the new normal? How are businesses and business models going to change? So you're right, it's not just companies, it's investors, it's foundations, it's consultants, et cetera. And as I mentioned, it's a $50 billion industry. So if we can just redirect, you know, every 2%, we can redirect through a channel that in yours to the benefit of nonprofits, that's a billion dollars towards nonprofits. Yeah, I think what's so fascinating about this model is basically your cost of goods sold is going to not for profits or to charity. So if you do the kind of good that you would expect to do, literally you're, you'll be giving uh, hundreds of millions of dollars a year to not for profits that people are passionate about doing good work. Correct? Yeah, and I think, and I think as consumers, we've kind of all figured out that maybe we're not getting a fair value exchange for our data or our opinions. Maybe, maybe a nicer way to say is a less transparent value exchange. So this gives you a way to monetize that, only instead of pocketing it yourself, you're doing it for causes you love. Yeah, it's, it's, it's your data, right? So Facebook having a $600 billion market value business off of my data seems kind of unfair. Now, again, you could give the data to the person, but we are, or the money to the person, but what you're basically saying is people want to do good. Here they can do a very quick, you know, quick survey on their phone, less than a minute, and it would go to help a cause that they care passionately about. Yeah, and the key though is we've been able to raise enough money so that we can go at risk and buy the data and, and then resell it. But we hope it's the first of many business models that get created that sort of bring together the best of the private sector and the public and NGOs, which I think GSV is particularly noted for, is 
how do we create new models where everybody wins? Yeah, well, um, and I believe in serendipity and I think you do too. And so this happened uh, on Easter Eve, but I got a, a message from one of our longtime friends, Bill Milliken at the community and schools talking about how community and schools has been absolutely slammed and I was talking about Rob about this uh, conversation this morning and I thought, why not put together two good friends? So at about nine o'clock on Easter Eve, and I think Bill's still in his tent, I can see his wife next to him as well. Um, uh, we were having a conversation about how 100X could partner with community and schools to um, help with what's going on there. For those who aren't familiar with community and schools, it's an organization that Bill Milliken started uh, over 40 years ago to work in some of the most uh, difficult communities in the country with the idea that, you know, to, to get through person to graduate through high school, these kids have other challenges, such as having a roof over their head, food to eat, an adult that cared about them. So this program has done amazing things, now working with 1.6 million students in over 2,500 schools across the country. One of the coolest things about uh, community for schools is that what he's been able to show is a dollar invested in community and schools has returned over $11.60 in benefit. And so anyway, we were delighted to put the two together and they've got a very exciting uh, partnership that they're gonna announce this morning. So maybe Rob, well, I'll turn it over to you and, and, and Bill. Yeah, so, so very quickly, as Mike said, we're excited to get the ball rolling. It's obviously the 100 year flood for many nonprofits. And um, I got exposed to CIS and Bill, and frankly, I was blown away. Um, so we're going we're gonna to get it going with the first $250,000, our organization, under a Data for Good program. So we're going to ask people to opt in on this, on this phone call, but also there's a lot of people around the country who passionately believe in this organization. So we're going to put in motion Data for Good, um, and we'll, we'll guarantee it that it'll at least be $250,000. Uh, assuming we source the, the data, which I think we will be able to easily do. But we'd also offer anybody else who can be a data buyer or a partner, if you'll, if you'll contact us, we'll try to, to flow that through 100% to CIS. So, so my, my hope is that this turns into a seven plus figure initiative and we can give you more details, but uh, we're just excited to, to launch this through GSV and to support truly a great, great organization. So Bill, tell us about what's going on with CIS right now and how this can help and how they, people can help you. Hey, thanks Mike and, um, and Rob and uh, our president of Communities and Schools, Ray Sadania and I so much enjoyed making this happen today with you all because it couldn't come at a better time. Uh, as you mentioned, we're dealing with a million six hundred thousand uh, students a year and and 91% of them are on free and reduced lunch. Our whole model is to coordinate all the resources kids need around the school. And we put in there a site coordinator, I call it the relational router. The, the principal runs uh, the program in the school, but we deal with all the different issues that kids have, of mental, physical, spiritual, whatever. And this person is so trusted because they're there for the kids because we know it's the relationships that change kids, not the programs. So they're trusted. And so there's no school now to coordinate all these services around. Uh, we coordinate them because teachers are being asked to be mother, father, sister, brother, social work, or everything but teachers. So we try to free them up to do it. But what happens when there's no school? 58 million kids are out of school right now, including ours. So people like on our board like Artie Duncan and others have been able to have schools stay open so our folks can get food from the food banks, the faith community or whatever to the schools and our site coordinators make sure these kids get the food uh, uh, that they would be missing at school. Then some corporations have given us backpacks so that our folks can go to their homes and leave food outside for the, uh, for the weekends. So we're, we're on every day with our folks out there on the front lines that are loving these kids, getting the resources to them. And then there's the social emotional part that they can talk to them on their phones, help them get through this crisis, but also prepare them for the future. And three, we wanna get them as much education as possible because it's gonna be a while before they're back in school. So 
we need help desperately right now. So real quickly, and, and we know that, and we're so delighted that we're able to, this community can help with, with CIS this morning. So people that need to reach you, Bill, at CIS, and want to be part of this program, and want to help CIS, how do they reach you? And we'll, we'll put this, by the way, in your information on chat, but go ahead just real quick. How do I reach you? Well, my personal is Millican B at cisnet, C-I-S-N-E-T dot org, or go to our website, uh, uh, which is communities and schools. Yeah, and or, 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 or come to me, mm at gsv.com. Rob, so for, for people who want to participate in this program or other not-for-profits that want to know how they can work with 100X or companies that want to uh, get the information, participate and help out investors, uh, foundations, how do they reach you? Yeah, Mike, it's rob.pace at 100xinc, spelled out, dot com. And, and that'll be on the chat as well for people. Guys, thank you so much. We've got a full program thank with you too, but... Uh, really exciting that uh, this is something that we're going to be able to do to help and uh, stay safe. Thank you so much, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, uh, now we're a little behind, but we'll we'll uh, we've got a lot of good stuff in front of us. So thank you. That was important. So right now we're going to turn it to our first panel, which is the future of education as a benefit in an AD world. I'm going to have the opportunity to moderate it. Uh, if you could bring up the different panelists right now, I'll, I'll just make a quick um, introduction of uh, people and, and then we'll kind of get in, into it. First, I'd like to, to introduce Ellie uh, Bertani, who is uh, Senior Director of Learning and Reskilling at Walmart. Obviously, Walmart is the largest employer in the United States. I have, we also have Leanne uh, Levensailer, who's the chief marketing officer and has strategy at Workday. Workday, obviously a leader in human capital software uh, and also one of the 100 best companies to work for um, in, in the United States on uh, a routine basis. We also have David Blake, who's the founder and chairman of Degreed. Uh, Degreed is a leader working with enterprises creating knowledge maps. Also this morning, he announced his new uh, company called Learn In which is uh, focused on this white space of uh, lifelong learning and reskilling and uh, work with enterprises as well as individuals. We have uh, Rachel Carlson, who is the CEO of Guild. Guild is uh, a leader in the education employee benefit area, having been working with uh, Walmart and Disney and others. She also was in the Forbes uh, list for 30 under 30, and she is a leader in the movement of stopping the spread with the uh, former American Express CEO, Ken Chenault. And last, but certainly not least, we have Rick Shangra. Rick is now the managing partner at High Rise, uh, but formerly uh, had a number of um, senior leadership positions at Arizona State University, including being the CEO of uh, the ASU's uh, Enterprise um, Enterprise uh, Solutions Group, Enterprise Partner Group, sorry, which did a number of uh, amazing initiatives, including InStride and Centana. Rick is on the board of InStride and um, is, uh, has got an amazing background, not only as an educator and administrator, but as a very successful entrepreneur as well. So with that, I am... Uh, uh, very pleased to have you um, all on the, on, the, on the call this morning or the Zoom this morning. Uh, maybe to start things off, you know, two months ago, obviously, we were in a world where it was all about a war for talent. You know, as a corporation, it was about a paying, train, and retain to be successful. And now, you know, and I, I don't know the figures came out yet, but 16 million unemployed in the last three weeks, and it's going to get worse before it gets better. You know, how has the how has the both the environment changed for you? And do we think this is sort of a this is this uh, is this a short term thing in terms of adjusting, or is this going to have longer term consequences? And maybe I'm going to first that uh, and I'll turn it to the panel of everybody's opinion on this. But maybe Rick, you could start things off. Yeah, thanks, Mike, and thanks for uh, your leadership with Deborah on these uh, summit meetings. They've been absolutely fantastic. 
Uh, look, I, I, I think anybody would be crazy to think the world's going to be the same going forward as it was in the past. And I think uh, it's going to affect uh, all dimensions of it on the, on the higher education front. I think we're particularly challenged moving into uh, the next couple of months in terms of understanding enrollments and our traditional model, let alone uh, the new model that's emerging in the AD, Mike, as you call it, where, uh, where, we're, where higher education institutions of all kinds are going to have to readjust their models to serve not only their traditional students, but a, a wider set of students. And this includes, which is why we're on this panel, how do you better serve uh, employees and corporations? And that's something that some uh, higher education institutions have stepped up to, others haven't. I think this is gonna be a call to action to become much more active in that space. Uh, and particularly with uh, Guild and Instride and others being uh, at the forefront of trying to bring those institutions together to try to offer those kind of, uh, of benefits to uh, employees. LA, uh, Walmart, how's, what's Walmart's uh, view in terms of what's going on and, and how you position yourself for the future? Yeah, I mean, you know, Walmart um, is in a little bit of a different scenario than a lot of companies uh, out there in that we're really pivoting to hire rapidly, as, as I'm sure everybody on the, on the call is aware. Um, you know, for that, for us, that's really interesting. We went in a position of um, always really um, focused on attracting talent, but having really a limited pool to pull from. And now there's lots of new talent in the market. And so we're really, uh, as you might imagine, focused on how do we hire the best of the best out there um, who can really come in and um, serve our customers quickly um, and, and learn quickly in the business. Um, we are, will still be, as we always have been, focused on retaining and career pathing the best and the brightest um, here at Walmart as we think over the long term. And our educational benefits program and educational benefits in general really helps us by helping us identify those with a growth mindset uh, and those who are eager to progress because those who sign up to learn more are often future leaders in the company. And we really think of our strategy as a diamond in the rough strategy where, um, uh, you know, we always look for people who have more potential than their formal credentials might indicate um, or their formal educational background uh, and we help to grow them in the business. So um, it, it's an unusual time for us, uh, but a lot of the, the strategy remains stable. Yeah, that's great. Uh, it sounds like you're looking to be playing offense at the same time. You know, right. Sure. Yeah, that's great. Rachel, uh, talk about what the guild, how the guild is looking at the situation today and kind of the forward opportunity. Obviously, you've got tremendous momentum in the in the core business. Are there other opportunities that are being created? How are you adjusting? Maybe you want to talk about what you're doing with Walmart. Sure. Um, you know, a lot of Guild's core insights were formed from our collective work as a co-founding team in 09, 10, and 11, both working in the Obama administration and in the community college sector. And that was the last recession, right? And what we saw at that time was that low-income learners were flooding the market to find a way to learn and upskill. And they were getting a lot of mixed message. I think the, the Obama administration did a nice job of pointing them away from high-cost, low-quality programs which were concentrated in the for-profit space, but we pointed millions of students to what I'll call low-cost, low-quality options, where we saw 5% graduation rates and effectively dropout factories, but we taught all these students that they were the dropouts, which I don't think was the case. And so our big focus, part one, is really thinking about how do we make sure that in this recession, we're highlighting the low-cost, high-quality options for the low income learner who is going to have some access to either employer funding and government funding, but not enough to afford all of the schools on the map. And in fact, where they have the least knowledge is what those high quality options are that are tied to demand driven outcomes. And so we're leaning on our employer partners more than ever to help clarify where are the jobs of the future. It's partners like Gainsight and Unity who know what are the customer service jobs of the future and what are the QA jobs of the future and helping the retail worker or the hospitality worker whose entire ground has been shifted out from under them find that next knowledge economy job. Um, and so that's where we're spending a lot of time based on those same insights from 08, 09, 10. The second thing I'd highlight is that many of Ellie's peers were a part of a working group we started private conversations on a year ago, knowing that at some point this bull market was going to end and having conversations about what does a recession landscape look like for these employers. And the, the brilliant thing about the best and brightest in the Fortune 500 is that they all said, hey, employee for now, customer forever. 
and we want to figure out how we're going to support these companies. And so we are now accelerating those plans. Um, I'll, I'll admit it happened so much more aggressively than any of us could have anticipated with those unemployment numbers, but we are preparing and working with a number of companies to ensure that that strategy that allows education not just to be an employee benefit for today, but a recessionary severance benefit or a furlough benefit um, is underway. And, and we privately launched in beta with a group of Fortune 500s uh, just a couple of weeks ago on exactly that. And I would like to talk to you about that more in, in a bit. Leanne, what are you, guys, what are you hearing from uh, your corporate partners? How do you see things evolving or, and how things have changed and how you get, how's Workday positioning to, uh, to support companies that you're working with? Yeah, well, thank you. Thanks Thanks for having me here too today. It's a delight. Um, you know, agility has always been extraordinarily important for organizations. And, and we talk a lot about what does it mean to have organizational agility from a systems infrastructure standpoint and a cultural standpoint. But I think with this crisis, um, it's put a big spotlight on a company's ability, organization's ability to truly be agile in the face of such uncertainty. Um, also our, you know, reliance on external talent versus internal talent in terms of getting the job done, skilling and reskilling what, what you need for the future. I, I think it is now more than ever, just a big spotlight has been placed on, on those, um, you know, what, how an organization needs to respond. That's what we're hearing from our customers is how, how do we get as much agility as possible? And I mean, I th as we look at our own business at Workday too, we're 100% we're focused on our existing workmates. Uh, uh, you know, we are not on the, on the market out hiring right now. We're focused on taking care of our, uh, of our employees, ensuring their health and safety, but also ensuring that they can be supporting our customers. Um, and so our customers, you know, we apply, we offer mission critical applications for them. And so they want to ensure that we have the right kind of team members to, to keep that, their systems going. Thank you. And David, um, well, first of all, congratulations announcing your new company this morning. Maybe you also may briefly mention what Learning is doing, is about, but, but also what are your insights about what you think is happening and in in what, what's going on in the future for education as an employee benefit? Appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, the, the trend, that I think will get accelerated by this moment is it at two ends of the spectrum. We used to have full-time students who maybe had a summer job, but were mostly dedicated on their studies. And at the other end of the spectrum, we had the full-time worker who largely didn't need to train or reskill. They had a stable career, 30, 40 years with a company. And what we've seen is this trend of sort of it's starting to mix. So you, you know, now the average student is sort of working one, two, three jobs. They are having to work full-time to support a full-time tuition. And so we have this sort of working student now. And sort of, you know, 20 years ago, we saw the executive education model really sort of emerge and take hold. But that's kind of where the market has kind of gotten. And there's still just a lot of white space still between those two sort of bookends right now. And so that's where we are really focused with learn in is, you know, how can we help even bring those further together more learning while earning. And I think, especially with what um, COVID is doing right now, there's a real opportunity for companies to be more humane and actually get a better ROI and how they deal with payroll reductions with this moment of, uh, taking the workforce that they have and reskilling them. And so what we are working with companies on are learning sabbaticals or learning leaves. So part-time work, part-time learning as kind of the new normal, um, right in the middle of that spectrum. So 30 years ago, um, I, well, almost 30 years ago, I, I was a research analyst that found Starbucks coffee and one of the ingenious things that they basically came up with this idea that um, healthcare for even a part-time worker was such an important benefit that they were able to take their turnover from call it 150% per year to 50% per year. And they were able to more than pay for that benefit by the added retention and frankly, the goodwill that they were able to create you know, with, 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 with their uh, employees. 
So it was like a genius type of move and it became a, a huge um, advantage for them for, for, for a number of years and then other progressive programs. You know, five years ago or so, they did the program with Arizona State. And Rick, maybe you want to talk about that. How do we think about education as employee benefit and ROI? There's a bunch of data and I, I, I want to get into it. And, um, you know, some people provided some additional data, but how, how do they, how, how do companies think about the ROI? You know, what, what are sort of the tangible things? Maybe Rick, you want to talk about sort of the beginning and how the Starbucks partnership came and how it's evolved. And I'd love to hear everybody's kind of view on, 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 on this kind of concept of ROI and is this, how, how important is this for obtaining, training, retaining uh, knowledge workers and, and other workers? Yeah, hey, hey Mike, that, it's a great analogy. And let me start first by sort of extending your analogy. When you think about health care insurance, it started out in business as something that employees could pay for at a reduced rate. And it was sort of health insurance as, you know, as, as a option, right? Then it moved to health insurance as a business where the employer began to pay an increasing share of it or pay for all of it. And now it's moved to health care into well care and well-being and where you know, companies are now trying to measure the well, well-being of their employees to make sure that they you know, come to work on time, that they're healthy, that they have good psychological and cultural and uh, organizational skills. And so I see that same, that same pathway for education, tuition assistance programs, which were great, but not used very well. Education is a benefit, which has moved to now where there's much more focus on trying to bring education to employees but then ultimately moving to what, what we call at Enstride strategic enterprise education, which is how do you get and measure ROI on, uh, on uh, providing education in terms of retention, in terms of attraction, in terms of improved effectiveness in the organizational workplace. Uh, and I can tell you with Starbucks, uh, uh, those conversations early on actually used that analogy, Mike, and then, and then began very early on saying, what are the metrics that we're gonna be measuring against in part uh, to, chat, to meet the same challenges that Starbucks had with health insurance payments, which is to say, is this a benefit to our shareholders? And, and it turns out it's not only a benefit to the shareholders in terms of financial return, but a huge benefit to employees and a huge benefit to the way the marketplace now thinks about health insurance and now increasingly thinks about uh, education as a benefit or what we call strategic uh, enterprise education. How many, I mean, how many, can you say how many students um, ASU has from in the Starbucks program within Stride? Yeah, uh, we, uh, 12,000 uh, degree seeking students graduated uh, over 3,000 degree students. But there's an important uh, caveat to this. I'm, I'm sure Rachel's seeing this at Guild. And I like Dolly's comment about diamond in the roughs. And that is, we've had to also put a program in place that had students that may not qualify for a college education and, and create what we call it a earned in admissions process where we let uh, employees take a couple courses just to test their skills and ability, actually get build some more confidence in their ability to come back. Um, we use this unfortunate term that you used a uh, dropout, you know, so you have a lot of em em employees that feel like they've dropped out of higher education. How do you bring them back in? And so within Stride, we have a program now where you can take a couple courses. Who cares about your prior grades? Who cares about your SAT scores? If you pass those couple of courses, you earn into being able to gain the program. So it makes it more accessible to a larger population of employees. Great. So Rachel, if you wouldn't mind kind of adding to like how the people that you're, the companies that you're working with today, how are they looking at ROI and what kind of tangible, I know on the website it talks about, I think a $2 and 30 cent or something like that ROI, tangible ROI that you're able to provide today. But, but maybe talk about that a little bit more and how, how your, your clients, partners are, are, are looking at that. And I'd love to hear from Ellie as well. And, and um, thank okay. you. Yeah, sure. So there, there's two ROI equations. There's the hard cost and the soft cost. And the hard cost, we've been so grateful to the Lumina Foundation for really leading on a standardized formula that all of the employers in this space can adopt. And you know, partners like ours with Discover have published that work, but other partners have just leaned on that framework in a really helpful way to measure the recruitment, 
the retention and the promotion benefits. You know, across the board, we find that on, on those metrics alone, the program always pays for itself and nearly always has a 2x positive ROI above that $2 mark. And you saw the average number, which is in the 230 to 240 space, depending on the industry. Perhaps the more interesting thing to talk about is the non-tangible soft ROI as well. And that comes from things that are incredibly difficult for employers to measure, but highly valued. It's that concept of employee for now, customer for life. What is the experience that the consumer market has with my brand? And, and I think that's where Howard Schultz is a genius, right? He figured that out on the health benefit side. And so it doesn't surprise me that um, Starbucks hasn't needed to participate in the formal ROI research because much of the benefit has been to them in that soft ROI of the experience that America or the world has with your brand when they know you treat your employees well. Um, that said, it's a huge benefit to the employer that they can see the ROI in just the hard costs. And we've seen that an employee who takes advantage of a program like this has a 2x or greater chance of being promoted on the job, which is worth quite a bit to the company. They have a much higher likelihood of retaining from about a 56 frontline out, uh, year long retention rate to a high 90s retention rate. Um, and then you see the recruitment costs really come down tremendously when they offer a benefit like this. So all of those things are important and help make sure that this program always pays for itself on a per student basis, which is critical. But Ellie can elaborate on, on some of the softer and the harder costs that a company like Walmart sees. Perfect, Ellie. Yeah, so just uh, tagging on to what Rachel pointed out, we, we have actually three internal ROI studies going on uh, currently um, related to our program, Live Better You, in partnership with Guild. And um, the first indications all have been coming back extremely positive on retention alone, right? If we were just to look at that single factor, uh, the, the, the program is more than paying for itself. But of course, the acquisition um, component, as well as the promotion and advancement component, um, add on top of that. Two additional factors I would, I would discuss that I think are interesting. One is performance, right? It's, it's hard to quantify the increase in performance, but the only purpose of learning programs uh, at, at baseline is to drive performance in your, in your company. And so we know, right, that the uh, associates who are taking advantage of these programs, as shown by promotion rates alone, um, are delivering higher performance for the company. And because we have built our program to align to the skills specifically that we need now and in the future at Walmart, and we've been very strategic about the programs within our portfolio, um, we are seeing um, higher performance with the associates who are, who are engaging in these programs. The other component that I think is interesting to discuss um, is, is cost reduction in the learning program itself. So Walmart, through our internal training program, which is called Walmart Academies, um, spends a very large amount of money every year investing in our associates and growing their skills. But there are certain things that we are not well designed to, to train, like advanced data science, also that touch a very small proportion of our population. And it makes a lot more sense for us to partner with um, great educational providers, um, many of which um, are less well known but offer great programs at low cost um, to upskill our, our associates in specialized areas then even to go out into the marketplace and acquire these, um, these individuals who are at very high cost of recruitment. So um, we see value in, on multiple fronts in programs like this. Great. And just a reminder, um, we're, we're getting great questions in from the audience. Please uh, keep them coming. I'll do my best um, to, to ask the questions, but if we don't respond, we'll, we'll try to get back um, afterwards. So, so uh, why, don't, why don't I... Uh, uh, Leanne, why, talk about Workday, and it's supposed to be one of the you know, best, it's been consistently recognized one of the best companies to work for uh, by Fortune for, you know, routinely. What are some of the key attributes of that, and how important is the development of people as it relates to the culture of Workday, and what do you see in the, the better companies that you work with as it relates to the emphasis on, on, on learning? Oh, well, I'll just echo some of the things that Ellie mentioned. I, I think that a holistic approach to learning in an organization is essential, and, and that, that will come through many, uh, many different programs, many different opportunities, which with the goal is, is performance, it's organizational performance. At Workday, we, you know, we strive to be at the forefront of technology and innovation in the enterprise for our customers. 
uh, to offer them their mission critical applications. And as such, learning for us is not just a cultural pillar. It's not just a, a nice thing to do to be a great place to work. It's mission critical for us to do that. So we need to be constantly reskilling, upskilling, um, and, and bringing in an ecosystem of providers and programs that we offer to our own workmates. And that's consistent with what we're hearing from our customers as well. Our customers want to be able to not only plan for and sort of adapt to change that they're, they're facing, but they want to be able to seize new opportunities and, and in some cases even create opportunities uh, for innovation. And so I would say in many ways, we try to be a, a beacon for our customers. We try to live out some of the best practices that we hope to also enable for our customers. So that's awesome. And, you know, one of the challenges, and, and this is, I call it the paradox, which is to attract the best people um, and to compete in the marketplace, corporations need to have a, a, a robust learning program because what the data has shown that that's the number one thing that millennials are looking for when they go to an employer is what is that, you know, it's, it's, it's over, over money, it's what is my learning opportunity. Um, the, the, the challenge with that, and, and Ellie provided me some better information, but, um, you know, basically the, the, the millennial has, has uh, a, a, a characteristic of leaving jobs, you know, after two, three years, I think the current data that was shown to me is 2.9 years to four years, but even that, to make that investment in the, in the, in the, in the employee, you know, how do you make that work? And, and, and David, I'd love to get your yeah. thought on that. And, and how, do you, how do you see the future of making that equation work? You have a concept that's maybe a little different, but I want to, if you have a chance just to briefly talk about the, the, the learning leave concept, and, uh, and then I'd turn it to others to kind of get your thoughts on it. And, and there might be some, and there could be an adjustment in the world that we just uh, may be entering the AD world. Maybe it's not gonna be such a quick turnover, but, but, but David, go ahead. I mean, if we break this down, the World Economic Forum says that more than 50% of the workforce is not going to need to be reskilled in the next three years. The rate of the labor force that is participating in a reskilling or educational program right now is like sub 5%. There's a massive gap between how many people we are upskilling right now and the, and the need that we have. And so as you look at that, you know, what barriers remain that are keeping us from being able to sort of open that aperture and get more people upskilled and reskilled and really came away with time and money. And you sort of touched on both. So right now, World Economic Forum, the average cost of reskilling is $24,000 on average companies are spending about $1,300 per employee. So there is a funding gap between, on average, what is being spent on employee development and what is required to really meet this moment. So we've got to talk about money. But the biggest constraint of all is actually remains time. And so, you know, when we talk about money, one of the innovations that we're bringing to the market is income sharing agreements for corporate training. So they've been used now with universities, they've been used direct to consumer, they've been used with boot camps, but they have not been brought into the enterprise training equation. And one of the problems that solves is what you mentioned, which is right now the average tenure for millennial is 2.5 years. It's really keeping companies from being able, like sure, I'll spend $1,000 for you to take a Pluralsight course, but no, I am not going to spend 25 grand on you to materially upskill you. Why? Because you're gonna be gone on average 18 months from now. And so one of the things we have to do is fix that paradox in the market. And I believe that income sharing agreements can do that, that they can fix that time horizon, allow either an outside note holder or the company themselves to recoup um, the cost of that training um, whether or not that person stays employed with any one uh, employer. And so it, it solves the time horizon problem. On the time side, that is actually the biggest constraint in the market for more people, is that people don't have enough time. And the solutions from the past were really built on this archetype of that kind of single breadwinner who had a lot of support at home. This we will pay for your MBA if you come back for three years, or we will send you to executive education. Who does that work for? That works for the people who have a massive amount of support 
behind them in their lives. Who does that not work for? The person who is taking care of their uh, elderly parents at home, the people who don't have uh, help at home with the kids, the people who are working more than one job. And we've got to give our workforce more time if we are going to expect to see more people be able to participate in upskilling. So learning sabbaticals, we believe are a way of helping companies come around this concept of the fact that they are going to have to begin to give time. You talked about education as a benefit. Well, paying for the program is great, but if we can't create more time in the system, more capacity in the system, then we're going to continue to just be working with the sort of same numbers that we've been seeing. We've really got to open that up. We believe learning sabbaticals is a concept companies can get around to do that. Yeah, really interesting. So Ellie, um, in your title, you got one of the more interesting titles I've seen, which includes not only uh, head of learning, but also reskilling. And, and David talked about uh, the world economic data and, and the need for 50% plus of reskilling. How does Walmart look at reskilling? And what are some of the programs that you think can be most effective there? Um, yeah, so we, we think about reskilling in a couple of different ways. Um, over the past couple of years, we've thought very intentionally about reskilling. Is how do we how do we look forward into the future as uh, as to where we know the job growth is going to be in Walmart, and really offer programs um, to help associates raise their hand, have choices about where they might want to go in the future, and then redeploy into those roles. Um, so as we built the program around areas like IT, health and wellness, as our healthcare business continues to grow. Um, in other strategic areas, um, we're we're very mindful now of how do we career path um, graduates into new areas in the business so that they can advance in their careers at Walmart. Because one thing we know at Walmart, we've always held true to the core, is um, we tend to see more success with people who advance through the company um, than uh, with external hires, um, particularly at more senior levels, because that the, the business is so complex and interwoven. Um, that that tenure and that experience is critical. Um, we are also starting um, to look at and think about in partnership with some of um, those on the phone here today, um, how do we think about um, both uh, finding uh, employees um, who are currently uh, displaced from other organizations and hiring them into our organization and potentially looking at how do we reskill them to be prepared um, to be with Walmart. Um, and uh, thinking forward, as many companies are, to um, how do we want to treat associates as they leave the company, our company, in the future, um, should that ever happen? Uh, and, and what are the benefits packages we can offer them that provide um, uh, greater stability and the ability to reskill as they, as they look for their next step in their careers? Uh, I'd, I'd like to comment on a couple of things David says, because I think they're quite interesting, the constraints he put forward. Um, money and cost, right? He referred to the gap in, in the cost. I think one of the important things we're seeing is um, costs are, are sort of disproportionate today, right? Higher education has continued to, to inflate in its costs at a much higher rate than um, other costs in society, uh, and, and that has to be addressed. Um, but we also see a trend towards shorter term reskilling programs, not your traditional four year or even two year degree, but short term certificates. Uh, a lot of innovation in the marketplace right now that is really driving down the cost and meeting employer needs of specific um, targeted skill sets, at lower cost and therefore much easier for employers um, to bear the burden. And I think the other, the other piece that's really important in the marketplace to drive and continue to drive is sort of the, the information asymmetry that, um, that learners face, right? They don't know what are high quality programs um, that are affordable to them. And so there's this paradox of, you know, uh, you know, in, in historically often um, choices, for example, for profit universities that may or may not be great players in the market um, that that market well and people are attracted to um, because they don't have great indicators of quality. And so that's another thing we need to continuously focus on to help drive down costs. So let me, um, one of the questions I have for the group, and I think you all have perspective on it, is you know, Guild is, is doing extremely well, Instride is doing extremely well. We see this wave of you know, education as an employee benefit as a, as a merging trend, even with you know, some of the uh, challenges that we have. Why, you know, the, the, it seems like the university is core in that 
future and, and how the, you know, the university is going to be able to provide uh, knowledge and you know, courses and so forth that, that, that are aligned with that. The company needs you know, that. I mean, it's a, it's a core skill, it's a high ROI, reskill, all these things. What, why is the, why is the, the, the company, what does a guild do? What does it in stride do? And maybe at first I'll start with, you know, Rick, from your perspective, uh, you know, having been at Arizona State and being the architect of, of this in the many respects, I mean, why did you see a need to sort of have a partner in addition to just Arizona State? And, and, and Rachel, I want to talk to you about what you're doing in the platform and how that works for the value. And I'd love to get the, the, the Leon's perspective from a works day and how this kind of ecosystem you know, all comes together to create um, the, the right kind of um, value proposition. But Rip, you know, please give me the, you know, how, how you see that. Yeah, look, look Mike, it's, it's, it's um, clear that historically universities and corporations have uh, found it difficult to connect. I mean, let's be honest, it's, it's, it hasn't been an easy uh, set of relationships. Um, you know, there've been some research projects uh, there have been some educational training programs, there have been some uh, uh, executive education programs, but at the end of the day, the ability for universities to connect deeply with corporations and corporations to connect deeply with universities has been really challenging. And so uh, this, these boundary, what we, what we call boundary standing organiz, uh, boundary spanning organizations like Instride or like uh, Guild, they can sit between a university and a corporation where they can understand what the corporation's needs and you know Ellie and and Leanne and have, have done a great job sort of articulating what they need and then working it through an intermediary to then connect back to the university to interpret those needs and make sure the university can provide those needs has been a really important piece of this and I look it goes without saying that uh, ASU signed up uh, Starbucks what five years ago six years ago it's been some time uh, and to be honest with you, not a lot happened after those five years, even though we had this fantastic program, in part because the university itself wasn't well designed to be that boundary spanning organization to connect with corporations. And so I think it's really important to have an Instride or, or a Guild to be able to understand the needs of the corporations, make sure there's the, the competencies and the skills on the university side, which by the way, as, as you and I've talked about, requires some rethinking on both sides about how that works. Corporation being more willing uh, to bring in the universities, uh, the universities being more willing to, to work uh, effectively with corporations and for faculty members in particular to see these kind of programs as not simply a financial gain for the university, but something that's of value to society. And I don't think universities have done a great job you know, conveying the value of these programs to their faculty so they can engage more of them in the process. Great. So Rachel, what's, what's the kind of value proposition you provide to the university and, and, the, and the enterprise? Sure. I, I agree with everything Rick just said. I, I did my graduate work studying the success of the Starbucks ASU model and wondering why it hadn't expanded faster and, and was fortunate to start a conversation with Chipotle who had tried to mimic it and was struggling mightily to manage individual relationships with universities. And they had a particular need for a more robust marketplace of options. Um, Chipotle has a very diverse worker base. In particular, they have many folks who are English as a second language learners. They needed things that weren't just bachelor's degrees. And so they really informed a lot of our early work about why a marketplace is critical. And so from day one, we've aspired to have everything from English as a second language and high school completion programs all the way through postgraduate certificates and credentials for someone who did earn the bachelor's but isn't where they want to be on their learning journey and has another chapter left to learn. And so I think that's been incredibly valuable to our employers, but I'll, I'll let Ellie say whether that's the case, is that we've been able to bring a full marketplace to our employers rather than expect a, an, a, you know, a strong but and mighty but small HR team or upskilling team to have to go broker relationships with dozens or hundreds of universities. And so when we look ahead to Guild's future, we're delighted that we've dramatically expanded our team so that we can have dozens and then hundreds of universities in our network. And, and we're delighted that we built the software that allows us to partner technically and financially for the employer with all 3000 universities, as well as any boot camp provider, any uh, non-traditional provider. And I think that financial backbone and the software that was built, as well as that broker relationship is what our employers tell us most they value. Great. So Leanne, 
you've got kind of a unique role because you know you have you're obviously a important uh, software business. You work with companies, you work with universities, and you know you, you have kind of an interesting window. All of this. What role do you see kind of the technology provider playing, and and the value add between the enterprise and the, the and, and the university? Where do, where do you see the, where the real value gets can get created? In the yeah. I think the core, it's a great question. The core technology platform really has to be an enabler of a holistic set of learning programs, uh, inclusive of education as a benefit and some of the other programs mentioned. You know, one thing that, that hasn't been mentioned here today that um, David really reminded me of is some of the, the great, the innovative work that's being done by companies internally to increase capacity around establishing an ta internal talent marketplace. So the, these marketplaces aren't necessarily just to take a new job within the organization, but to actually, you know, participate in agile career sprints or gig assignments inside the organization where they can develop skills on the job. And so they're, they are um, collecting career experiences that make them then more valuable. It also helps with the question you asked earlier about how do we retain the millennials? How do we give them that path forward? Um, to know that they have a career and they have, the, you know, we want to retain them, we want to engage them. Um, having um, these innovative talent marketplaces really signal to employees, we care about you, we care about your growth and your development. We're going to actually help you in situ uh, collect these experiences so you can be more valuable to the organization and more fulfilled with your career journey. So those are, you know, you have to take all these programs as a core you know, infrastructure provider that we are into account um, and, and it make sure technically you can enable them, but also the way you present those experiences to the workforce become really important. What are all the options and opportunities that they have? And then on the, on the back side of that, you know, how are they impacting the organization? Rachel mentioned earlier about promotion rates and retention rates and, and getting that information for the ROI studies. Um, that's an incredibly important partnership that, that we have with, with the companies represented here to say, here, here's the data. Here's actually what's happening um, with the workforce based on the, you know, um, completion or um, connection with these programs. That's great. So Ellie, uh, Rachel said, ask you, I want to, I want to hear from your, you know, tell me, tell me about uh, how you look at the, the role, the, the, the need and the value that is created by um, a, a guild relationship. Yeah, uh, so everything I think that Rachel said holds true. Um, for us, you know, uh, operating at scale is always the challenge at Walmart. If we were to, to build the team, um, and we actually historically had a team that ran an employee benefits program, it was a fairly large team just from an administrative um, perspective. What, what a partner like Guild really brings to us is sort of three things I really value. First, they're really a, at heart a tech company, so they're, they're incredibly data driven. Um, unlike, uh, you know, more traditional um, providers out there, um, they've enabled us to get a lot of insights on how our students are performing, how they're balancing work and education, and really merge their insights with ours to give us a really deep look at the talent profiles of associates in the program. Um, so you know, being a true data-driven company is incredibly valuable to us. Um, the second is uh, the marketplace, right, that she referred to of um, really curating the best of the best providers out there. I talked about how hard it is to know as a learner or as an, uh, an employer um, who are the good actors, who has the best outcomes. They have an incredible research team um, that always uh, looks at things like um, uh, how quickly do people, uh, adult working learners, get through programs um, at a university? Um, how successful are they at completing, which is critical to us and our metric of success? How much do they tend to earn after? Is there a, a wage boost? Because that indicates to us quality programs. And so just bringing a lot of data to bear and curating a network of high, high quality institutions that compete against each other in this marketplace. And the third, which I think um, can't be dismissed, we believe is a critical factor, is the coaching element, um, which is giving um, associates in the program uh, a weekly touch point with someone who is their personal coach to help guide them through um, a balancing education and work um, and who really serves as a counselor for them. I can't uh, underemphasize how important I actually think that is because it, you know, adult working learners who are going back to school who 
aren't your traditional 18 to 22 year old um, are navigating a lot in their lives and may not have been in school for a long time uh, and have to problem solve on a daily basis, um, how to balance it all and having someone they can turn to just to talk through that and navigate all the experiences um, helps people stay in the programs and complete. So guys, hey, 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 Mike, can I, can I just uh, add on to that? Because we had exactly that experience with Starbucks in that, you know, you launch a program, you offer a free undergraduate degree to your employees. We sat back and just, you know, sat by the phones and sat by the machines hoping, you know, people are going to sign up. Guess what? They didn't sign up, right? And why didn't they sign up? Because exactly for the reasons you're talking about, they're, they're a little bit concerned about how they're going to succeed in the program. They're worried about how it's going to work out with their job. They dropped out of a couple of courses before and they don't feel confident in it. So having those counselors being able to help people through these programs, particularly in the early stages to get them comfortable with the program, how it will work, what the outcomes would be, all the, you know, we use all the same metrics at Instride, and, and being able to actually convince people that they can benefit from it. And so th there is this myth that if you offer a free degree that everybody's gonna sign up. That's not necessarily true in, in corporations. It takes a lot of work to actually get those programs to be effective. So we've got less than 10 seconds left and I've got to keep the program on time, but I do want, just because I feel like uh, it would be, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask David Blake, who is an original thinker, um, if he were to quickly, quickly give sort of what the uh, radical future of learning and earning could look like for corporations, universities, and, and students in your, in your most succinct way, what does that look like? And then we're gonna to have to say goodbye. So you, you get the last word, David. Universities start credentialing every semester and employers align to allow their workers to access those three month chunks of education. Do that and we have a lifelong model of education uh, and it changes everything. Awesome guys, this was a fantastic, I can't tell you how much I enjoy it. What a great panel, thank you so much for your time. And now we're gonna to go to our second panel, which I'm uh, equally excited about. And so I wanna turn it over to our model. The, the, our second panel is the future of higher education in an AD world. Um, and and uh, for the moderator, we have our longtime friend and GSV Ventures uh, advisory board member, Bill Salman. Bill um, his, was, was a, a longtime a uh, legendary professor of entrepreneurship at Harvard Business School, um, one of the most insightful people and, and in terms of innovation entrepreneurship. He was head of the Arthur Rock Center at Harvard and has been connected with many of the, the, the most amazing uh, innovators in the, in the world for, for many years. So I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, fat, I'm, I'm anxious to hear uh, Bill's moderation of this panel. We have an amazing group to, to join him. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Bill from here and, um, and uh, looking forward to listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, I'm always anxious too, uh, <laughs> but eager to have such a great panel. The, uh, look, uh, higher ed had problems before the virus um, epidemic. Uh, cost too much, uh, takes too long, uh, not transparent, not necessarily focused on outcomes, some broken business models across the education space. And uh, so this is like a giant game of pickup sticks. Uh, in some cases, people have reinvented what they're doing. Some organizations will fail. And our job today is to try to peer, not just in the immediate future, but beyond that. So uh, maybe we'll start with, uh, we had this forced migration to online learning. And uh, what are the implications of that for universities? What did they learn about the uh, pitfalls uh, and frankly, the opportunities? And maybe we'll start with Rick. Um, Thank you, Bill. Um, well, I think we've learned a lot and I want to put it under two buckets. First, the forced migration, which largely took place in the United States, um, was overwhelmingly just people turning to Zoom video or some other platform like it and putting what they do in the normal classroom online. They're, you know, because this occurred, the shutdown occurred in the middle of, a, for most schools, was the middle of semester. Um, there wasn't really time to plan and create courses for the online medium. 
And so what you see predominantly was people just doing what they did in the classroom over Zoom. That has probably a twofold implication, two types of implications for universities. One, people who were doing discussion classes found them generally satisfactory. You put the people on gallery view, you've got 20 students in your class, it works just fine, just like being in a classroom. People that were lecturing, unless they were already doing a lot of multimedia and, and, and active learning exercises in the classroom, like polling, um, they found it generally unsatisfactory. And so I think we're gonna come out of this, in the US especially, with, with the professorate sort of split over the efficacy of online learning. So attitudes will get improved for some and uh, go negative for others. Um, and that'll be interesting to see how it plays out. out overseas, however, I think um, what, what we've actually seen, at least from the Coursera vantage point, is a tremendous acceleration of a phenomenon that we've been pursuing the last year or so, which is the sharing of courses across universities. So that, so that what happened in, around the world is over 2,500 universities have actually signed on because we offered Coursera for campus, or that is to say our whole catalog, all our courses free for universities for the duration of, this, of the spring semester. And we have about 2,500 universities constitute over 4,000 learning programs. We've had you know, 600,000 course enrollments and uh, uh, just astonishing um, uptake and that, you know, where the courses from another institution are basically substituting for what the, what the university would be doing in completing the semester. So I think we'll see that, that idea, which was talked about a lot at the beginning of the MOOC revolution, that you might be importing courses from other schools, that's going to take off now. So uh, maybe, Carol, you could talk a little bit about uh, Davidson and... You know, the, the, the world Rick just described is uh, um, maybe fine for premier professors and courses, and, uh, but what does it mean for a different institution with a different culture and a different relationship with its students? So how do you think about that? Okay, thanks. Thank you. And thanks for having me. Hi, everybody. It's good, good to see you. Hi, Michael. <laughs> I haven't seen you in a while. So, um, uh, for Davidson, um, I, it's a little bit hard for me to specify exactly what we've learned about online generally because the situation here is so specific. So our faculty, we have very few classes over 35, so they're generally discussion interactive classes. There's a lot of project-based learning and our faculty have been kind of what I would call leading with care. How are you? How's your family? People are in a position of profound vulnerability. Our students are inviting people into their homes in ways that they you know, have probably never done before. We have some students on campus who for whatever reason were unable to go home. So, so step one has been, you know, how's everybody doing? And, and trying to build on the kind of community that makes Davidson a desirable place for one's education to begin with. And then faculty have been adapting, particularly in lab-based science classes, have been adapting to this new uh, situation. So we have faculty doing the actual lab work in the lab and then enabling the students to do data analysis. And what that I think has led us to do is focus on what we're really trying to help students learn. What is the real learning that we're trying to achieve and, and sort of distilling down to that and then making sure that whatever methods we're using in this new context, we're able to uh, help our students learn what we're trying to make sure that they're, they're able to learn. Um, I think a lot of, if you ask a lot of our students and faculty, they would say how much they miss the community. So we've had a lot of community building events. We have something called Cold Open every Tuesday night, which is a, a sort of art open mic art night. We've had a lecture series on social distancing and physical distancing, which is basically about the history of pandemics. So a lot of events designed, you know, drop in office hours, a lot of events designed to replicate the, the campus environment for students who are missing that really profoundly. Um, I do think a lot of our faculty have learned new tools. So, you know, um, they've, they've learned tools that will help them collaborate, for example the ways in which technology facilitates collaboration. Uh, I think they've learned new ways of providing immediate feedback. So in this environment, feedback loops for our students are really, really important. So how do we give almost real-time feedback? Uh, and, and I think they've learned other sort of platforms that will be helpful when, we, when we're able to be a residential community again. 
So I, I, I think the issues are around um, changes in learning and teaching and what their relationship is and the degree to we, in which we get feedback. You also mentioned something about just the human side of all of this. Uh, so maybe Michael, you could talk about, you have a very strong culture, you have a set of values uh, that drive what you do at the school and maybe talk about what the implications have been of the shift to uh, less physical contact, less emotional contact. Sure, it is wonderful to be with everyone. And first, let me just say this, one of the, um, unexpected opportunities that this new uh, lifestyle presents is for you to discover all the ways in which you are inept. Um, my children have changed my background. Uh, and I have <laughs> changed it back. Um, so I was spending the good chunk of the first part of our time together trying to figure out how to get my daughter's baby picture out of my background. <laughs> um, so let me just say it's a humbling time in my world, okay? It's perfect. Um, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, not, wait till I see her though, okay? <laughs> um, but let me say this. It is, um, we, we are in uncharted territories. Um, th this is something beyond anything any of us could have ever um, surmise, expected, um, hopeful, or, or anything like that. Um, it, it is a challenge for us because as you alluded to, so much of who and what we are is our culture. And our culture is this we over me um, sense of Gideon's army, right? We are small, but we are mighty, and we are mighty because we are together. And we are together. So we have to attempt to communicate to each other that we are still here, we are still present, we are still us. And some days that works better than others. Um, you know, one other thing that we deal with that is tremendously challenging is 80 to 85% of our students are Pell Grant students and they come from extreme poverty. Um, the extreme poverty um, has, has resulted in them living a life full of trauma. And much of what we have done in our time together is try to speak to that trauma, try and soothe and settle that down. And right when you get people to understand and believe that they are in a safe place and that they have an environment that will always be there for them, you have to rip it away from them in the interest of their physical safety. And that, you know, we have watched the, the way in which our students have responded to that. And, and it's not always been positive. And we didn't expect it to be positive, right? I mean, you can't begin to address trauma, then reintroduce trauma, and think that there won't be an impact to that. And, you know, I'll, I'll go one step further. If any of us are honest, we know that the days of this method of delivery and education are longer in front of us than behind us, right? I mean, we can't invite students back to an environment where we can't ensure their safety. So we don't know when that is going to be. And then to have that conversation on top of the other conversations I mean, we will be paying a mental health price for this moment for years to come. And it is heartbreaking. And it's unequal. It's, uh, and it's unequal. depends on the starting point, depends on the experience of the time. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's, it's very tough. Uh, Kathy, maybe uh, you, you've had uh, multiple experiences and dealt now with uh, lots of institutions. How do you? How do you think about what we've learned and what doesn't work? What, what can we do better, by the way, to create um, a different kind of online experience or something that replicates some of the best aspects of community that Michael talked about? Yeah, thanks, thanks, uh, and thanks for having me. Um, it was such an, a challenging time, it's just amazing. Um, interestingly, uh, Kevin Guthrie and I uh, did a very quick case study of Duke Kunshan, which was the first U.S. degree program 
uh, to move online because during the Chinese New Year, many of the faculty and the students, this is a liberal arts college founded in China by Duke. Uh, and then uh, the, the virus hit China and faculty and students couldn't make it back to campus. So we flew down to Duke to talk to them about how in two weeks they'd gotten online. And I, I can remember making jokes about the guy sitting next to me on the airplane, wiping down the seat with the Clorox wipe. And now in retrospect, I'm quite grateful that he was doing that on that airplane trip. Um, but this, is real, this was really an emergency response to salvage the second half of a semester across the mid. So we, we were looking at Duke Kunshan and all of a sudden, all, within two weeks, all of American higher education is going online. Um, but these, these are not well thought out online courses. These are essentially emergency responses to try to salvage the semester for students. So as we, I think we've learned a lot, um, as Rick mentioned, uh, you know, I, I spoke to a faculty member who's a Samuel Johnson scholar at Vassar. He's teaching his 10 student seminar on Zoom and he's thinking it's going pretty well. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, the, the faculty that do big lecture classes those lectures are now being caught in perpetuity and they take a look at it and they realize that maybe those lectures aren't so effective. And maybe in fact, you know, they shouldn't be lecturing in their face-to-face -face classes either. They should be thinking about different ways of, of teaching. Um, I, I suspect, as, as Michael said, this is gonna go on a lot longer in front of us than behind us. And I think for me, the really important thing that we need to confront is that there are incredible inequities in how uh, this is affecting students. Um, if, if you're in, in a, a, a big house on Long Island with lots of bandwidth uh, and lots of technology, you can handle this, this rapid shift. If, if you're uh, in a very small apartment in an urban area with six or seven other people and you're worried about food and, and you know whether you're gonna be able to pay the rent, it's a little harder to focus on, on what's happening. So. I think as we move forward, we're gonna to have to think really, really carefully about um, the inequities. I spoke to a faculty member this morning from 10 feet away on a walk outside. Um, and she was talking about really focusing on asynchronous learning at the moment because her students were in such different situations that they all couldn't participate in synchronous courses. Um, so we're gonna to have to do a better job of, of using what we've learned on online education from places like Coursera to make sure that if we're doing this longer that the courses are actually better. Well, I think um, this issue of how do teachers learn, like a, we've had this long period of different feedback loops and basically uh, ratings at the end of a semester. Uh, it's not like Bridgewater where it's ratings at the end of a nanosecond. Uh, <laughs> And so I, I do think that's going to be an important part of this because we're going to learn. Uh, and and I think uh, thinking about this issue uh, issue of mastery, what how do we measure what our students know at a point in time? Uh, how do we really know as opposed to how do we think it's going? And we fool ourselves, I think, all the time. So uh, maybe for any of you, how do we? Who are going to be the, the, not winners, but the institutions that thrive in the post-COVID uh, environment? What are their characteristics? What are, they, uh, what are they selling? What's the outcome that they're trying to accomplish? How do you think about that? Well, I, I would say that I think the institutions that thrive during this period and beyond will be the ones that are less in love with their tradition and more in love with their students. Right, because this period is going to necessitate that we innovate continuously. What worked one week might not work the next week because the students may be in a completely different place. And what what I have found what you know we're doing at Paul Quinn is we have just stopped and said, you know what? Let's be honest with ourselves. Let's let's ask ourselves some really tough questions should we be introducing first time freshmen into this environment, right? Just very candidly, what, what experience can we guarantee them? You know, I mean, it, I mean it's, it's a painful one from an economic perspective, but if we're going to be good stewards of our students, what, what do you tell a student who 
you know, has counted on going away to college, counted on this experience, and you can't deliver that experience. Right. Best case scenario, maybe you can deliver that experience in January. Right. So, but even even then, um, I'm not sure. Uh, like so, you, but but you have to ask that question, whatever answer you come down with, and you have to continuously ask yourself these questions. You know, what can we do better? How do we continuously reevaluate this? How do we check in with the students? Um, it, frankly, you know, do we need to adjust our fees? Right? right. I mean, like, can we justify charging what we've charged, right. um, knowing that we're going to see a drop off in our ability to provide aid? So right. maybe there needs to be some very real adjustments. And I think, you know, one, I mean, much of what I believe in this is sort of what I've believed all along about just schools, period. We must continuously understand the idea that no problem is ever permanently solved. That we're going to have to continuously um, innovate and challenge our preconceived notions. Um, we're going to have to look for new methods to deliver information. Um, and we're going to have to be very, very honest with ourselves that we might not be getting this right and engage our students as partners and how to get this right. And I think the institutions that do those things have the best shot coming out of this in, in solid shape. So can I, can I just pick up a little bit on, on that? I, I agree completely with Michael that uh, we've learned more from our students as we've, as, we've, as we've gone through this about how we can serve them more effectively. And we've learned about the range of needs that our students have as Kathy was saying, depending on, on where they are and, and what their situation is. Um, I would say that, that that broad diversity of potential learners and the ways in which the post-secondary educational sector will continue to differentiate as we go forward might be something to look to and might um, invite institutions and other organizations that provide post-secondary education to think very clearly about what it is that they offer and who they serve and how they or we know that we're delivering that. So we've thought a lot about the kinds of talents and capacities that we claim to develop here at Davidson. How do we know we're developing those and how specifically are we developing those so that we can, as it were, disaggregate the total residential college experience and offer specific opportunities to a much broader range of learners who might only want a specific thing. So for example, I think from employers, we hear that our students are good at navigating the unfamiliar. Okay, that's a really important skill in an unpredictable world. How do you navigate the unfamiliar? How do you deal with an unprecedented problem? How do you face an economic situation where you may have to change not just jobs, but careers many, many times? What does that look like? If we can figure out how and where it is that our students learn that and figure out how to scale just that, I think that um, that's something that we that that serves all all learners more more effectively. Do you know what I mean? So I guess I'm saying by listening to our students, we're learning the ways in which the whole sector has to differentiate to serve the incredible array of learners out there that want more education than they now have for whatever reason. And, and that institutions can partner together to deliver that array of learning opportunities to this highly differentiated group of learners looking for it. And I don't think we, traditional higher ed, have, we have not historically been very good at that. We've been defensive about what we've done in the past. We've been attached to traditions without any good reason. And we haven't been willing to um, specify how it is we do what we claim to do with sufficient precision to be valuable to other institutions. So can I just jump in and add something? It's gonna be with employment, just thinking about, you, you go ahead, Kathy. Th thanks. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, first of all, I think any institution that survives this is one that's gonna be innovative and creative and is gonna to have to change, absolutely. But I also think it's incredibly important that we recognize to get through this, it's gonna to have to be a partnership between all the different sectors of American higher education and the government. I think if the government doesn't help here, it's gonna be an unbelievable challenge. And we should really be thinking about higher ed uh, right across the spectrum as an investment in infrastructure for economic growth when it starts to recover later. 
And each sector is going to have to do slightly different things, but almost all are going to have to figure out a way to get costs down and quality up. And that's going to be really rethinking uh, within each sector how we do things, I think. Well, you, you, there are ways to do costs, one of which is to get the number of people you're touching and who find value in what you're doing to be uh, better. And the value proposition of having a very uh, low student to faculty ratio, that may not be a sustainable model. And maybe Rick, you could talk a, a bit about Coursera. You know, I flippantly asked, will Coursera be the largest uh, educational institution, higher ed institution in the world? Um, you didn't respond, you said, oh. <laughs> How do you think about that? Uh, we already are the largest education. <laughs> um, I believe the largest institution in the United States on physical campuses is the California Community College System with about 2 million uh, students. Um, in the last month, we've had um, over 4 million active learners, people actually doing work in courses, participating in over 8 million courses. So. Um, you know, it's, it's, we're, it, it, it's going to happen. And I, I think the, I, Karen raised some really interesting questions about differentiation. And I would just expand that a bit by thinking about audience. Coursera, the whole proposition behind Coursera and edX is scalability. And the idea, not only that, that we have this, these resources, these valuable resources, our faculty, who can potentially teach many more people than they teach today. And what we've found, of course, in the course of these last eight years, is that we are, um, we are reaching 85% of our students are beyond university age. 85%, only 15% are under age 22. So there's a huge market out there for, for lifelong learning, for career-based skills, the kind of thing that was talked about in the last panel. And, and for lifelong learning for in liberal arts. Um, there, we've had, we've, we've got a, you know, over a million people taking liberal arts courses this month, <laughs> you know, with, with, uh, with the uh, upsurge in enrollments. So, um, so it's, um, it, 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 there, you can scale your faculty and doesn't, when you're scaling your faculty by a factor of, you know, 50 or 100 uh, or even 10, you can obviously lower the cost of your core business if you are trying uh -huh. And you can charge much lower rates for the, for the online courses. But the original business model was free online access to MOOCs. So edX, Coursera, there was a lot of, and then I think you've tried to figure out, well, how do we get people to value and pay for and engage with mm -hmm. a different way of getting them uh, through the entire process? So what have you learned? Uh, so, so there, what we've learned is people will pay for credentials in where the, where the, where the courses have some relevance to their careers. And, the, and, you know, we charge basically $49 a month for, for such education, which is very low cost. Um, and that's a viable business model. We're actually doing fine. Now, we have way more free learners than paid learners, but we have enough paid learners that we're, you know, doing well as a company. So, uh, and the universities are sharing in those, in those revenues, um, essentially splitting them with, with the company. So it's, um, it's, a, um, it, it's a strategy that I think many universities can undertake. And the, and the most the recent innovation that I mentioned is there now seems to be an appetite, at least outside the United States, for importing courses taught elsewhere in undergraduate uh, teaching institutions. And so um, that, again, provides a way for, for both, for both to enhance the revenues of the course provider institution and to much radically lower the cost of, of, of using these courses um, it, or providing education to students in uh, developing countries and places like that. Mike, Michael, Hi. what, um, how do you engage with the local business community in terms of uh, this path that uh, the time they spend with you is an important time, but it's part of a longer process? And how do you think about that? What's going to change over time? We, in the previous session, we heard about Walmart and Starbucks and uh, all of these quite remarkable investments in human capital. How do you think about that? Yeah, you know, we are, um, we're something unique in the higher ed space in that we're the first urban work college. 
And so our entire model is built on providing students high quality internship experiences that they otherwise would not be exposed to. And we're watching when this program works that it, it absolutely changes the economic trajectory of the students. I mean, we have students who are accepting jobs upon graduation with companies like um, J.P. Morgan Chase and with um, um, private equity firms and, and entities that we never would have been able to get them placed in because they would not have had the requisite life experiences to do that. It was working beautifully until COVID-19. And, and now we've got to retool that whole experience and make it a virtual experience for the students, which then you know, really challenges how they acclimate themselves to these opportunities. So we are on a dime having to change the way we prepare the students for it. Um, you know, we've added an additional cost, I mean, course. We already had a sort of a work course but now we have this entirely different experience that's designed to teach students how to engage virtually. Um, it changes the economic model, right? Because part of what institutions were paying, I mean, companies were paying for, you know, now they've got, they've got virtual needs. Uh, they've got revenue challenges. So now everything has to be repackaged and redelivered. And we're doing that in real time. Um, I mean, it is literally the conversations that we have almost every day about how can we do this? Because for us, our entire economic model, because of our humble um, endowment, our entire economic model is built on, hold on a second, I'm sorry, son. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I've got kids everywhere here. Um, the uh, <laughs> welcome to the new higher ed reality. Great, great background, Michael. I'm homeschooling. Yeah, I'm homeschooling a nine year old and a five year old, and I'm running a college, right? Like it's all over the place here, okay? Um, but what, what we have to decide is I mean, for our economic revenue model, is tuition, the revenue from the work program and fundraising. Well, <laughs> philanthropic dollars are gonna become increasingly harder to come by. Mm -hmm. The work program revenue is gonna be down right. and our students are, are already coming from families on the margin. Right. So now all of this has to be incorporated. Now, interestingly, one thing that we were, de that we're developing because we thought there might be a disruption coming in the future and we saw a market need is our program called PQCX, which is long-term uh, affordable reskilling courses, right? Everything is built on not a degree, but on a credential. And, you know, we are beta testing it, but we're going to have to roll that out, you know, exponentially faster than what we had originally planned because one, circumstances dictate that there's a need for this in the market. Right. We thought that because there was something to the tune of 50 million or more Americans who had some college and no degree that might be under um, undermatched in terms of their employment potential, that we needed to be able to put this in their hands. Um, now we know because that number has jumped through the roof. So, you know, um, we are making decisions right now with no safety net that will absolutely dictate not just whether our students are successful, but whether we have an institution two years from now. Can I, like, Michael makes a really good, a really good point about the aspects of Paul Quinn that don't translate easily into a remote environment. And so if a place is built around this notion of community and value yeah. and the we, then one of the things we're also learning right now is that that is really valuable. Like that community and that sense of face-to-face um, of -face contact and the kind of engagement and feeling like one is participating in something larger than oneself, that is really important to people. And I think it's also important to a democratic society Right, so we, we, oh, can, can we, it, content delivery, yes. Like we, at, we're an edX partner and we've learned a ton from the ways in which we have uh, 
worked with edX and, and created community in new kinds of ways. But I would say that the kind of community that Paul Quinn builds, that kind of community matters. And it helps us all develop a sense of obligation to some larger whole and, and prepares us to be effective citizens in a putatively democratic space. And, and that kind of active engagement with the world, it seems to me, is also really important. Are there lots of ways to get it? Yes. But I don't want to trivialize the learning that takes place because we're doing that and bringing together people from very different backgrounds with very different ideas and beliefs and asking them to create a community that functions. And, and that, that to me, you know, if you just look around at this polarized country we live in, that, that to me is very important. And, and so will we be able to measure learning outcomes with respect to a particular subject matter? And will we get really good at doing that in all different kinds of delivery modes? Yes. Can we do that inexpensively? I hope so. But I also hope that we can figure out how to scale this other thing that residential higher ed does well. I'm going to need you to do that for a commercial on <laughs> behalf of Paul Quinn. And, I wrote down punitive you know, democracy, you. <laughs> just so you know. That's what I wrote on the board. <laughs> right, right. Let's talk, Michael. <laughs> but guys, this is, it, it's something about uh, a different lifelong relationship with the communities you built. So uh, Davidson, Vassar, Yale, all these places, uh, Paul Quinn. They all have this distinct culture that, that we think of as it ends at four years or you just look to people to give you money or whatever it is, your relationship. Uh, but I think Rick is talking about a world in which lifelong learning, the previous panel was talking about lifelong skill acquisition and credentialing. Maybe that's the world we ought to aim for. And uh, that that world actually is a pretty attractive world if, if this helps people think about that transition. But I don't think we should give up on getting more students through a bachelor's degree. We know that that's incredibly valuable. Right. That evidence is clear. We haven't done a very good job at that in America. We, it's not very equally at, available to people depending on race and income. And it's going to get worse as right. a result of the COVID crisis. So I think all colleges and universities <laughs> need to focus on that and make sure they're contributing in every way that they can. I worry a little bit about the credentials right now, just because we're gonna have a labor market where there's an excess of people with BAs and MAs and PhDs right. looking for work. And I, I think it's actually gonna be pretty hard to figure out what the return to the credential is over the next three or four years. Well, I think, I mean, I think, I think that's a really interesting point. I, you know, so I, I sit sort of at this nexus where I think people, I think pendulum swing, and I think depending upon people's emotional mood, they tend to go to extremes, right? Um, we're gonna get through this period, right? Like, I mean, we will get to the other side and higher ed will absolutely need to figure out how to respond to it. There's no question about that, but it will figure out how to respond to it. Um, the credentialing piece wasn't going to go anywhere. That, that crowd was going to become louder and louder and louder because in a sense, it should, right? Um, but just as college, you know, a traditional college experience wasn't the magic elixir for everyone. I mean, you can look at the number of people who don't complete it and, and see that neither is everyone having a credential. Now I say that with full candor, I'll say this, that, you know, our academic model now includes credentials, right? So you get your experiential learning, your work experience, you get your subject matter mastery through your uh, major. And then you, you know, each year, you get the opportunity to pick up one to two credentials. Right. Um, and we did that because we recognize some students stop out, mm -hmm. right? Some students right. have a need to, um, to supplement what they're doing. We're hedging bets. Sure. And you want to give people the greatest chance to be successful, no matter how much you've charged them. Um, but I just, I want us to really be careful. Like this is a moment of great upheaval. And most of us are managing um, a level of emotional uh, dismay that we've, we haven't experienced before. So it's going to take us a moment to figure out what's the right way forward. 
Um, but I think the first thing we have to do is acknowledge we're going to be in this space for a long time. Like we're going to be here for a while, right? I mean, you've got to have widespread testing and you have to have a vaccine. And until we can address those issues, it's just right. hard to imagine getting back to quote unquote normal. But I think uh, going back to this issue of credentialing, I, I want to restate it as assuming everyone can achieve mastery, even though not necessarily at the same time. The thing I've learned from South Con more than anything is just uh, the bad assumptions we make about what people can learn and when they'll learn it and how it builds blocks. And I think that we talk about higher ed, this is a massive problem across the spectrum. And the, the problem with not having a bachelor's degree is partly because people are dropping out of school. Are they dropping out of school because we define them as failures? And I, I do think over time, the relationship and the responsibility is gonna have to shift a bit for making sure that people come into us, uh, maybe with uh, more capabilities, more aspirations than they do now. So and sometimes I mean, they I, drop, go ahead, Carol. I mean, I, I do think pedagogy, you know, we've shifted to taking much more responsibility for how our students learn, I think, than we have in the past. In other words, you know, if someone's standing up there saying stuff, and no one's learning anything, is that actually teaching? No, that's not teaching, no one's learning. And so, so to, 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 to imagine that it's our obligation to help everyone learn what they wanna learn, I think that's a little bit of a shift pedagogically at the, at the college level, at the university level. Um, and we've learned much more about how to do that, right? I mean, one thing I will say that Coursera and edX have done for the professoriate is help us understand much more effectively how people actually learn. And professors are paying so much more attention to that than we ever have in the past, right? How, how do students learn? Why does feedback matter? What kind of assignments are helpful? Why are case studies better than rote learning? How do you level the playing field in your classroom? All these things that no one ever thought about before, you know, mastery grading, just saying, you know, I want everyone to get an A because I want everyone to achieve this level of mastery in my class. So, so I am hopeful that um, the hurdles that we've erected in front of our students for no apparent reason other than to make us feel smart are gone and that we are much more engaged in the, in the activity of helping the students that come to us learn what they want to learn so they can lead the lives they want to lead. Right. I think during my last that, recession. That? Yes, go ahead, Kathy. Just, um, you know, I think enrollments uh, in, in uh, higher ed increased by about a third as people were coming out of the recession and looking to reskill. Right. So I think if I, it's gonna be at least that this time around. So again, I think if we can be really creative about how to meet that demand for uh, gaining new skills, whether it's um, credentialing Coursera courses or uh, institutions that normally haven't admitted adult learners from their local communities to fill empty seats. I think anything we can do to, um, you know, respond to that increased demand. Mo in, in the last recession, most of those students went to community colleges with open admissions, which were just overburdened and are already under-resourced, or to for-profits where they ended up borrowing money and not getting a credential that worked. So I think if um, the rest of higher ed can step up and think outside the box and figure out a way to respond to this need right now, it would be, it would be fantastic. And as Rick has said, we got to figure out a way to spread those expensive faculty across more students. And I think we can do that with technology and, and help during well, you could pay the faculty less. That's the other way to <laughs> <laughs> But they don't like that as much. No, so. I got, I, but look, um, uh, our time is uh, basically up. But, um, I think you've issued a call to arms, really. This is an opportunity to rethink, uh, to reimagine, uh, to invigorate uh, the human connection uh, and a sense of responsibility uh, for learning and guiding your path because nobody's gonna do it for you. The government has basically not done it for a long time and I assume they will not do it in the future. You guys may be more optimistic. But I, I do think we can look at this and say, what, what could we transform? How can we make this a much better, more inclusive and more effective educational system? Last comments? 
Rick, we need a think? major we need a major fiscal stimulus though. A good case throw money at higher ed. That would be a great place to throw uh, I'm it. All in favor. We're gonna be we're gonna be throwing money at everything, I think. Yeah. In training and survey. I think initially it'll be more training, get people back to work, which we'll need dramatically. But we can't, we're going to have to spend on education and spend on infrastructure, R&D, all the things that will drive us forward in the future, um, or we're going to have a long recession ahead of us. Well, I'm, I, whenever I uh, am involved with anything with Michael or, or Deborah, I, I enter having read the newspaper and being depressed, and I exit always optimistic. Uh, because people are the people that you make the difference. So thank you all very much for participating. Um, I learned a lot. Thank you, Bill. And thank you. And, 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 and uh, amazing panel. I think my takeaway is Dorothy, we're not in Kansas anymore. Right. And um, that is for sure. But I am optimistic with the talent applied to this incredible um, issue and importance for the future of society. This AD world, um, I think, provides not only uh, obvious challenges, but tremendous opportunities. I also want to make a point, while I hopefully still have people, Catherine Hill from Vassar, uh, if, you, if you haven't listened to Malcolm Gladwell's uh, Revisionist History Series 1, uh, their, their Series 1 Food Fight episode, where Vassar is highlighted and, and Catherine's hi highlighted is absolutely um, tremendous. If you if you care about equity and access, you got to hear that episode. And, and congratulations to uh, the what what she did at, at Vassar. Just some quick takeaways. Then we'll we'll, we'll look for you next week. I think um, you know Bill said it. You know the opportunity to kind of reimagine what the the future of higher ed can look like. You know with these tremendous needs and opportunities, but. You know, with the, in a in a world where we have all these tools available, technology enables the ability. Does Rick Levin talk about scale and have the best professors reach? You know, not only be able to get paid more, but reach more people and have the, the ability to have you know, impact. I think the reskilling need and opportunity is is huge to reimagine how we can use uh, the expertise and in, corporations who need this reskilling to kind of match with uh, people so they can really participate in the future. This lifelong learning, which is a mega trend and, and a clear opportunity for, for, for universities because that's where the content is and this need to not go back to campus, but how do you acquire this knowledge on an ongoing basis for the rest of your life? You know, the certification, there's nothing, I mean, the degree is, is, is important and great, but what other ways are you able to represent your knowledge going forward? I think that's a huge, huge opportunity and trend. You know, Michael talking about being engaged in the world, and I think that is a learning experience and how, you know, you don't separate your higher education experience with your, you know, being in the world experience, how this is blended in this concept we call higher ed, the blending of corporations and, and the university. And, you know, and I think a technology and accelerant, not only to create better access and lower the cost, but as a tool to provide information to teachers and professors about what's the most effective way on a real-time basis to, to, to teach students. I think all that was sort of my takeaway from that, 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 that amazing session. So what, you know, in signing off, thank you again for being part of this uh, program. We'll tune in next week. Again, it's at four o'clock Greenwich Mean Time. Um, and, and, and for those who aren't accustomed to Greenwich Mean Time yet, that's nine o'clock Pacific, 12 o'clock Eastern. We'll be uh, having a discussion on higher education, government policy, and, and much, much more. So thank you and enjoy the rest of your week and look forward to your comments and suggestions. Bye. Thanks so much. <laughs>